Ah, good morning and welcome and those that are visitors uh, just treat this as your church home and enjoy it and we're now up to a blistering 39 degrees versus where it was a few days ago down like at one so anyway good morning and and hopefully the roads are getting cleared off and people can get in and out of subdivisions and stuff now because that's been a challenge so for the uh, scripture reading today it is Proverbs 3, 1 through 8. My child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and abundant welfare, they will be given to you. Do not let, loyal, do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on, a, on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and of people. Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. You do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil for it will be a healing for your flesh and a refreshment for your body. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come together to worship you, open our hearts and minds that we may hear and understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. stand and sing with me softly and tenderly 491 softly and tenderly Jesus is calling God descend. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm looking up the doxology chapter number because we forgot to put it in there. And because that will be our offertory prayer. So it's uh, for the doxology is 119 in the blue hymnal. Okay, for the offertory, I will be reading from... First Chronicles 29, 6 through 9. Then the leaders of the ancestral houses made their free will offerings, as did also the officers over the, as the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of the thousands and of the hundreds, and the officers over the king's work. They gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents, 10,000 dacras of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 8,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. Whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord into the care of Jehiel, the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because these had been given willingly for with a single mind they had offered freely to the Lord. The King David also rejoiced greatly.
Now, if you will, please stand and join me singing the doxology. Praise God, praise God from whom bless Thank you. Please be seated. If the children want to come up this morning. I have a couple questions for you guys today. Do you know, does anybody love you guys? Who are some people that love you? Yeah. Dad. Okay, good. Yeah. Yes, definitely. It, 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 those who didn't hear, God and Jesus. Okay, that's an appropriate answer for in the church, right? Okay, yep. Yeah. Oh, that's good. They all love you, don't they? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So my next question is, how do you know that they love you? What are some ways that you know that they love you? Yeah. They tell you. That is super important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What are some ways that you know that they love you without them saying anything? How do they show it? You're right. How do they show? How do the? How do your people that love you show you that? <gasps> like that answer. Okay. What are some other ways? Taking care of you, Grayson. Hugs, Hugs are a great way to show someone you love them. Kisses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. So how do we, and that's right, all your answers are great. So we know that people love us. They tell us. They show us on the way that they treat us, hug on us, and, you know, provide us things, right? Not just treats and candies and all that, but they, you know, keep, get us clothes to wear, right? We have a nice warm house to live in. So what are ways that we know, and you said the answer, how do we know that Jesus, how do we know that God loves us? That's a good answer. He takes care of us, guides us. That's right. Is there other ways that we know that God loves us? He can't come, he, he doesn't typically come and just give us a big bear hug like Grandpa can do, right? But what are ways that we know that God loves us? Any others? What's this thing that we read in church a lot? And we should be reading at home a lot too. Yeah, what is it? The Bible. And what does the Bible tell us about God? And, and does the Bible say that he loves us? It does, yep. He says he loves us very much. And that's something that we always can know, even though we might not always have him holding our hand like somebody can do, but we know that God is with us because sometimes it just, we just feel his peace like we just feel at ease with things. Can, we can feel that. All right, well, let's have a prayer. Oh, God, we thank you for this day, and we're thankful for people that love us and uh, they show it through not only them telling us, but the way that they treat us and take care of us. And we thank you that you are a loving God and that you love us all very much too. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right. And because he loves us, we give him his own way. Have thine own way, 504.
Let's tell him that we love him too. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thy So glad to see you all here this morning. So I'm going to read from um, the Gospel of John this morning, the sixth chapter, and I'm actually going to back up a little bit um, further than uh, starting at 60. Uh, as I was thinking about this, it will take us a few extra minutes, but I think of reading in context a little bit further back in this chapter will help us in the understanding um, of what Jesus was trying to teach. So I'm going to back up just a little bit. So if you like to read along, feel free to do that, um, or if you'd like to uh, just listen uh, to the message this morning um, in the sense of uh, listening to Scripture, you're welcome to do that too. So. Starting at verse 22. And as I read this, I think it's important for us to know as we get into today's uh, topic is uh, some of the things that have happened just prior to this part of the scripture. We have Jesus walking on water. Kind of a big event and many of us uh, remember this story, right? We have the feeding of the 5,000 has just happened a little bit before that. And then we also have some, have some healing where Jesus uh, was healing uh, those who were sick. So he's starting to gain some momentum of people following him around, right? They're, they're starting to see these amazing signs and miracles happening and people start to follow him. So picking up in verse 22, on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, because you ate your fill of the loaves. Interesting comment. 
Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who has sent me. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread, bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said, to you, I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And that is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven, they said. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. I, I want to think, you know, we read these, these, this passage, but can we just think of the inflection that Jesus maybe have had in some of his words? Um, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets that they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they still died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks of my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks of my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. Whoever feeds on me, he also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? But Jesus, knowing himself, that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense to this? 
Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who, uh, who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to them by my Father. After this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. There's some amazing parts to this scripture, and I know it was a lot to, to, to bring in and to hear, uh, and there's a lot to unpack. So we're not going to cover that whole section of scripture but I thought it was very important that we hear a little bit of the background as we get into, and I'm going to focus on uh, verse 60 to the end of the chapter. Some very pointed words. Jesus trying to teach them. So, it's interesting. There's a lot of words and terms in here that I think it's just really quick that we do just a little quick review of, of when we think of what, what it means. So disciple, we've heard that used many different times, uh, you know, but a disciple was Greek really just for a learner or, or a pupil or an apprentice. So when we have that first part of the scripture, it said there was a lot of people, there were a lot of disciples. So those people have been following him with the miracles, they were kind of included into that lump uh, of, of learners and followers. The word blood, too, uh, is um, interesting. And when we think about, and I think the, the context uh, of blood and why, why Jesus maybe used it and why it upset the people that he was um, talking to and preaching and teaching with. You know, so in biblical writings, not only was it essential uh, to life, but also the seat of life's power, if we think of it that way. Um, sometimes referred to as uh, mortal life or flesh. Um, it was also connected to God, the life giver. It was reminded in the Old Testament then to consume blood was not permitted. And it was... It was not appropriate for people to consume blood. So when we see, you know, when they talk about um, of eating of animals um, back in these uh, biblical times, they, you know, they cooked that meat first. It wasn't, they could not, or I mean they could, but it was not appropriate for them to just drink blood. Think about in the context of the story we, that we just read about Jesus saying about they, he will, they will drink of his blood. The spilling of someone's blood, taking of someone else's life, was strictly prohibited. So if someone spilled someone else's blood, um, they were uh, most of the time, in, and with law, then they were put to death, or it was punishable by death. And then think about the priests, too. When we think of the priests in the temples and the sacrifices, I don't know about you, and we've talked about this probably in other sermons that I've done, is that I'm sure glad that we don't have to perform uh, sacrifices anymore with animals, right? I mean, that would, that's, that would be pretty tough, I think, for most of us. But the idea of a priest being the one that was able to apply the blood uh, and um, kind of work with it in the temple for our, on our behalfs. So Jesus also being a rabbi, a teacher, in a way, a priest, again was saying that he had the authority with this blood. An important part of this story as we move forward. And also we talked about, uh, there was some mention of bread, and just think of bread as the staff of life. It sustains us. And when we think about bread, we think about food, nourishment. 
So as we look back now, as we jump back into the scripture, uh, starting at verse 60, it says, many of his disciples heard it, and then they said, this is a hard thing. And in some versions it says, this is difficult. So another word that is used for this instead of difficult, um, as said in the reference material, is that they said that this is offensive. So difficult also kind of meant they took it as offensive. And just as I had mentioned of talking about the blood uh, and the bread, Jesus was, was saying things that went against what they were thinking, the very literal parts about what the use of blood was. Uh, and he was saying that you're going to eat my flesh and you're going to drink of my blood if you want eternal life. So these disciples were trying to process this in, in human ways and it was saying, not only was it difficult, or in other words, this guy is offending me. This is offensive. The other part that was offensive to them, when we think about what he just said, um, think back to verse 35. Or read back on, on 35, when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And then he talked about, and the people following him said, well, we know about bread, and we know about bread from heaven. Remember Moses and how he provided manna for us, or the, for our ancestors in the desert, so that we might actually be able to live? Jesus wasn't talking about just bread to sustain life. And in that scripture, he reminds them, well, they, that sustained life for them, but they still died. And what Jesus was starting to try to teach and encourage them is, I am more than just manna for this life. I am more than just bread to sustain us for a few years or a few decades. He was trying to teach them it is me, I am the bread of life for all eternity. That probably caused some offense for them as well. I think this passage, as so many of them does, reminds us that the crowd was thinking very literally, right? They were thinking not metaphorically about what Jesus was saying, but very literally about flesh and blood bread. Jesus was trying to teach them about true eternal life and that it was only possible through him. But they weren't understanding. And how many times do we read in scripture that the people when he was teaching, they just weren't understanding. They weren't, they weren't getting it. Or in these words, it was saying that the disciples of these other followers were, it was offensive to them. And then Jesus in, in verses 60 through 65 says, after he says, well, does this offend you? Well, what are you going to do with when the Son of Man ascends back to heaven? So he takes it a step further. He's trying to plant this seed with them that he came from heaven. And, and remember in that passage, they were saying, what do you mean you come returning to heaven? Aren't you Mary and Joseph's? We know them. I mean, what, what are you talking about? So he's reminding them again, what, you know, what are you going to do with this extra step when I return to my heavenly father? They still weren't getting it. In verse 63, he says, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. It's useless. And then he goes in 65, verse 60, it's, 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 it's not an understanding of something literally. He's trying to say it's a gift and that people come to this by understanding that it's through God, his heavenly Father, that brings this. It's, it's the Holy Spirit touching people's lives. Sometimes when we think in our own walk and our, on our own examples of, of, of being a witness, is there's some times that we just, in this, in this world of so much uh, data availability directly to us, right? If we don't know, what do we do? 
Who do we ask? Anybody on this side? Who do we ask on our phone? Siri, Google, right? Google knows everything. <laughs> What's that? Yes, and even then we still sometimes, like the, our disciples, we still like, he, he's, just think, Jesus was right there with them and they still were not understanding. Verse 66, they didn't get, I thought this was interesting when I look at the reference part of this, this part of the passage of scripture. Uh, when we look at verses um, 66, so they were, they were confused, they weren't understanding, they were getting offended, they were saying it was difficult. And it says, after this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Or in some versions basically said, you know what, we're leaving, we're out of here. You are not, kind of, we don't understand this, you're talking in, in riddles, or we, we, we don't, you're saying maybe that you came from heaven. We know that your dad is Joseph. I mean, you know, we, we don't understand. And in the show that we sometimes watch at our house, Shark Tank, and for those reasons, I'm out. Right, so they're saying they're, they're done. And it says that these were disciples, right? So these were some of the followers that said, you know what, I think we're done. Part of the reference material that talked about this, uh, I, I thought about, made an interesting point. It said, Jesus' emphasis on spiritual transformation, right? He was trying to show them that this wasn't about the physical. This wasn't about things of this earth. This wasn't about manna from heaven that we're going to eat and we're still going to die because of our mortal body. So Jesus' emphasis on spiritual transformation Rather than the political concerns alone, and think about, think about people who um, follow causes and are kind of just impromptu and um, just follow something just because a bunch of other people are following it, right? They just jump on the bandwagon and start following. I think this was happening partially here as well. It says, rather than the, the, the emphasis that Jesus was talking about spiritual transformation so rather than the political concerns alone that probably the crowd wanted to hear more of, causes the crowd, the disciples, those who are following, to lose interest and leave. Isn't that interesting? Do we still see that happening today? Think about that message for us. If we don't like maybe a message, um, you know, sometimes we read scripture and it's a little pointed and it kind of makes us uncomfortable because it hits a little close to home on how we should live our lives. Do we just say, eh, for that reason, I'm out. I'm not interested. This is not fitting into, you know, what's really comfortable for me. The message for us, I believe, uh, today in this passage is not through our human brain power. It's not through our own human understanding that we come to believe or have eternal life. In the passage that Mark read in Proverbs, it talks about not leaning on our own understanding or our own wisdom. We are trying to believe and get it through our own understanding what we think is real, or I should say is the question is, are we trying to believe and get it through our own understanding, what we think is real, what we understand, what we think is correct, what we think is right? I think that is our mistake, just as it was those followers that left Jesus then. Running it through their lens and their filter, they said, you know what, this guy... He's a crackpot, and we're, we're going to leave. And I was thinking about a couple of examples um, about leaning on our own understanding or maybe trying to figure it out through our own um, 
knowledge, wisdom, whatever that you want to call it, think of a couple of, uh, a couple of things. One, let's think of the creation story. How many days does it say that God created before he rested? Six days. Were those actually 24-hour days? Were they each day 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? Anybody know? We don't know. So why do we get tripped up sometimes on trying to, to filter that through? How old is the earth? This is one that theologians really get on board on, right? Is the earth 10,000 years old? Or are they call a young earth? Uh, or is it uh, millions, hundreds of millions of years old? We don't know. Someone said to me earlier when I said this one, they said, hmm, were there dinosaurs on the ark? <laughs> These are questions that we try to figure out. And there's things in the Bible, right, that we try to, to make right and that we try to say, well, this, is, this has got to be this way because. But is that through our understanding? Is that what we're trying to figure out? One of the things I thought about of when I'm processing these questions myself when we're trying to figure out some of these mysteries that God has put in the Bible. Is it more important to be right with somebody or is it more important to believe that God created? What is more important? I'll let you answer that yourself. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Think about that passage that Mark read again. What brings us healing in our lives? What brings us refreshment? It's not our own understanding. Verse 7 of Proverbs chapter 3 says, Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And this it will bring you healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. When we can step back out of our own understanding is how I kind of thought of that passage, when we can kind of step back of like, I don't have to be right, I don't have to have the answer, is the earth a young earth and only 10,000 years old? And no, there couldn't have been dinosaurs on the, on the ark. When I can step back out of that and say, you know what? Does that really matter on my witness to somebody of how Jesus is changing my life is about whether the earth was young or the earth was old? For me, I have to say, that is not something I should get tripped up on. It's not my understanding. It's not relying on our own selves, our own understanding. It's fearing God, trusting and believing in God having faith that somehow God has made all this happen. And that's what I believe. I mean, when we think about that, we think about, yeah, well, I don't know. If I could see God, I would believe. Jesus walked the earth. He taught them and tried to teach them that he was the son of God, and they still didn't believe when he walked among them. It's not about the laws. Jesus was saying it's not about the laws. It's not about the, the blood. It's not about the bread. It's not about the manna. It's, it's, it's not about the miracles. It's about the one who sent me and that you believe that I was sent by God to bring eternal life. It's not about what you think you know. And that's where us humans get stumbled up on, right? What do I know? What do I really know? Well, there's a lot of mysteries. I guess for me it's the saying, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. And sometimes, and maybe you're all the same way, sometimes the more I read, I feel like sometimes the less I know when I read the scripture in the sense of how amazing God is. 
It's about trusting that the I am, as Jesus said, I am the bread of life. There's no other path to eternal life. Jesus is saying, I'm it. I am the path. So Jesus, at the end of this passage, he says, he asks the disciples, some have just left. They're not interested anymore. And he turns to the disciples, and what does he say? Do you want to go too? It's almost like saying, are, are you with me, or, or, or do you just want to leave too? But I think that, that question goes for all of us too sometimes. Are we hanging, are we there with Jesus? Are we, are we gonna believe in him and trust in him? Do we wish to go away too? Trust ourselves? But Peter responded correctly. Right, when Jesus asked, well, do you, you guys wanna go away too? Everybody else is leaving. Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You are the words, you have the words of eternal life and we've believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the ability to, to think and to try to be knowledgeable about things and to try to understand. But as Jesus taught us, Lord, help us just to be focused on the main thing is that you are the great I am and that all that's, that's all that matters. Lord, be with us today as we leave this place. Be with uh, those who couldn't be here today. Be with Pastor John as he travels, and Tasha as she recovers from not feeling well, and others who are not here for whatever reason. Lord, we just pray that your hand be upon them. Be with us as we go from this place and help us just to be able to share that good news that we have had an encounter with you. And that's why we believe. In Jesus' name, amen. I was blessed with an earthly father who did take my hand. I can still remember his big, rough hands, his fingers, and guided me when I needed guidance as a child and even later in life. So it's very easy for me to love and understand this analogy of taking my hand and leading me, our Heavenly Father. Please stand and sing with me. Number 601, take my hand and lead me, Father.
Well, let us go from this place knowing that God's hand is definitely there. We just need to grab hold of it and walk with him. Go in peace.